Okay. Um, Ingalls and Carr, never heard of them, right? Um, well, that's not entirely surprising because I've kept a rather low profile since about 2001. Um, I, I became a partner in Ingalls and Carr when I was invited by Ingalls to join his existing firm as a partner um, about 30 years ago, I hate to say it. Um, he retired in 2001 and I decided that having put some structures and people in place to keep the business going that I would start to collaborate or, or work directly for um, larger practices in London. So I did actually represent uh, Young and Galt, who were a Glasgow-based practice, heading up their London office running hotels for several years, uh, desi detailed design and uh, construction of those um, in the South East. Um, I did a five-year stint working directly for Andy Von Bradsky, who most of you will have heard of if you haven't met um, at PRP Architects, during which uh, time I oversaw the detailed design and construction of some significant um, London residential projects. Um, and also um, an interesting prototype uh, idea that I conceived called the £100 a year house, which became known as the Glasgow House for Glasgow Housing Association, which um, we built as a, as a prototype. And um, this idea here, the, um, the umbrella house actually is a derivative from that based on the, on the suggestion that most people don't live in houses, terraced houses or detached houses, but they live in blocks of flats. So how do some of the principles that apply to the Glasgow house apply to this? Um, more recently, I worked uh, directly as, as a director for um, Chapman Taylor International Architects, large firm of architects with 19 offices around the world. I headed up their residential sector, but um, although I was on a six months notice contract, I decided in the middle of last year that I was going to step out of it and become a consultant to Chapman Taylor to allow me to, to, allow me to really focus on Ingalls and Carr because I feel we're at the tipping point. And I think when you get to a certain age, when you're thinking about retiring in 10 years' time or whatever, you can either say, can I cruise to retirement by uh, just allowing it all to happen and doing things the way I've been doing them, or can I get engaged with what's going on in the market now and actually start to lead the debate? And that's where I am positioned. So I don't know whether I'm knowledgeable enough yet to lead the debate, but I can certainly contribute to the debate, the debate and bring the experience I have particularly within the housing sector, but within other sectors as well. So enough of the advert, enough of the explanation, let's press on. Um, you will see charts inevitably like this at conferences like these, 1997 or 1995, um, house prices at maybe twice average annual earnings, but just look at them now, and they're way off the scale in London in particular. That's why we now have generation rent. How are we going to respond to the fact that the government have uh, recently been saying, look, not in these words, but I'm paraphrasing, we uh, accept that home ownership for every, everybody is not likely to happen um, and that we therefore must have a two-strand uh, approach. One is home ownership where possible and the other is the build-to-rent sector. Um, and I think we're going to see increasing focus on the build to rent sector to meet uh, the demand for, for housing. It is growing exponentially in the year 2000 at about 10% per annum. By 2020, it's going to be growing at about 30% per annum. It's the right place to be positioned, the build to rent sector, if, if you want to get involved in residential. And if you want to do off-site, it's absolutely ideal uh, for a number of reasons. Let me say, uh, let me start off by saying ideal because it's predictable, like student um, accommodation, like um, hotels, anything that involves replicating a similar product time after time with some communal facilities is ideal for off-site um, construction. And I think it can uh, apply directly to the build-to-rent market because I think that the build-to-rent market is positioned somewhere between um, housing, conventional housing, and hotel um, architecture. Or another way of putting it would be 
to say it's like student accommodation, only for grown-ups. You might have heard that phrase before, but we're talking about replicating a number of um, standard models and providing communal facilities to one degree or another. Here, for instance, are some of the uh, facilities that you might provide if you uh, go by the um, American multi-family housing which, uh, model, which Simon mentioned earlier on, where they divide the market into bronze um, silver and gold, um, an astute multifamily housing or built to rent developer will go and have a look at a site and decide what category it's going to fit in and therefore what facilities they'll be able to provide. Now, in the market in the UK at present, we're still trying to work out what it is that we're providing because culturally we're a little bit different, maybe slightly less sociable than Americans. I don't know. We live in slightly different ways, but the idea of living in the building and sleeping in your flat is where it's at and it is it is appealing particularly to generation rent and by generation rent i'm talking about people who might be professional people on good incomes from 25 to 35 years old but who are going to take at least 10 years to be able to put together a deposit to buy a house and therefore the mentality is now changing it is becoming in some reset in some senses more victorian where the majority of people actually rented their accommodation and landlords tended to be the exception rather than the rule. What facilities are you going to provide? You might provide a cinema if it's a gold standard or you might provide just a TV room if it's, um, if it's a, a bronze standard. And I think that the market in the UK will gradually divide into those kind of um, uh, divisions as well. At the moment, it has been pitched at the upper level, but I think as we heard earlier, that um, institutional investors want to know what's going to happen on the grand scale. Now, one of my business partners is chairman of um, uh, independent pension trustees and is well connected with uh, pension funds in uh, London. And he tells me that they're very interested in this concept and they want to get involved and they've got billions that they want to spend on it. But don't approach them with a 30 million pound, uh, 20, 200 unit PR, PRS development, approach them with a 600 unit, 100 million pounds development and take them one of those every month. And then you're talking about the kind of scale that they're going to be interested in. Now, even if you do that, even if I was able to do that, one uh, 100 mil million pound project every month, we're talking about, what, 8,000 8, or so um, apartments every year. But it's still only the tip of the iceberg in terms of meeting the requirements. So you can see that this is a huge uh, potential market. Media City was mentioned earlier on. This is phase two development. I was very much involved in the planning of this and in the detail planning in particular. I've uh, highlighted a PRS project um, which is 470 units. These are the BBC buildings over here where your um, broadcasts uh, come from in Salford and there are eight plots here, three of which um, uh, Chapman Taylor took forward and I was involved in the detailed planning of all of that. This is a courtyard. We conceive it as a sort of uh, quadrangle based on the idea that it's um, student accommodation for, for grown-ups. But um, when you look at the plan, you see it's very different from the way you might design a, a traditional flat of development in London, for instance. I've got two cores. Initially, we had four because we were going to make half of the building private for sale and the other half built to rent. But we were then told by the institutional investors, forget that, it's got to be one thing or the other. We want it to be one animal. And we then realized that it had to be much more akin to hotel architecture with corridors, which is completely counterintuitive to any, any architect of my generation um, where corridors were to be despised. Um, but now the corridor is coming back because it makes the management uh, and management of these buildings is extremely important. It makes the management so much easier, especially if you've got duct risers so you can adjust somebody's heating. And with this kind of concept, you don't um, replace, you don't go in and repair somebody's washing machine, assuming you haven't provided a communal laundry. You actually give them a new washing machine, take the old one away, and you repair it down in the basement in the repair room. It's about service, and that's what the generation rent are, are looking for. And we conceived this as a modular uh, potential uh, building. So you see the one bed apartment is, um, the, the two bed is one and a half times the size of the one bed and the three bed is twice the size of the one bed and although the it has swung back and forward as to whether it's going to be built in modular the interesting thing is that in designing it 
um, on that basis when the client said to us we've got to change the mix we need more threes and fewer ones or whatever it has been extremely easy to redesign it without having to change the external appearance or the structure of the building in any way at all so I'm suggesting that this is a good approach um, for the future now umbrella house is a registered trademark to Chapman Taylor it was um, I, I conceived this idea developed this idea put a team together to develop it and it is registered throughout Europe and the UK in exactly the same way as the Big Mac is registered throughout the entire world but it is still lettuce and relishes and a bun and a burger right so the component parts of umbrella house are just everything that you're familiar with it's the name that is registered and so we want to press on uh, with this idea by this name or another the concept is let's say responding to the idea that in London we shouldn't be building towers everywhere let's let's do traditional streets uh, restoring the urban grain and let's do them up to eight or nine stories high says Prince Charles. Um, well, okay, good point. So here's your donut umbrella house concept, the inner core where you can either close your blinds or not, depending on how private you want to be, creates that sense of community because you're living in a community and the outer skin can be dressed out any way you like. Here are how I think it can be done on an off-site basis. Let's start off with how wide the box should be and how long the box sh should be. So when I first conceived this, I came up with this size, a 25 square meter plan, 3.3 by 7.8 approximately, uh, because that was responding to what I saw as the ideal modular base to meet all the London um, plan housing sizes. So two of those then becomes a one bedroom at 50 square meters at the far end. If you put three of them together with a sort of concentration of the services in the middle one and a party wall down the middle, you get a 38 square meter um, studio, two 38 square meter studio apartments. You put them together like that, um, and this is your dumbbell plan that was referred to earlier. It's become the industry standard, makes a lot of sense, but it's bigger than the 70 square meter London plan size. So by um, taking the balcony inboard and keeping the, thermal and keeping the thermal envelope at 70 square meters, so it still makes sense financially. And by the same jiggery pokery, I can do the same with the three, um, the three bed dual aspect to comply with London plan. Um, requirements and as I say you can dress them up any way you like at all you can either um, express the fact that it is um, contemporary off-site construction as we're showing in the middle here or you can make it a little bit more contextual I think I'll do a bit more work on these to make them a little bit more appealing but if you take that end one it could be something like this where where that for instance is one unit and then you have um, a frame and a series of spandrels which are then uh, post applied without the need for, for scaffolding um, and you can apply your bricks um, now if you uh, to the module if you if you think about the fact that offsite construction is um, a, a branded product because it's uh, predictable and it's institutional investment then it might be umbrella house Uxbridge or umbrella house uh, elephant and castle um, and the idea is that you might not be able to compete with the private for sale market by um, by acquiring sites to do them in zones one to three but you can maybe do them in zones four and outwards and then you're coming into work in the center of town in your electrified mass transportation system with the government trying to ensure that the energy providers are making the energy zero carbon at source so it's a very green approach if you're building in um, a smaller town you want to be building in the center of town so you can get to work either by walking or by bike or by electric bike that's certainly very much a growing uh, phenomenon now and there's a, a notional uh, two-bedroom dumbbell apartment looking towards um, looking towards St Paul's it's never going to happen but you know what I mean anyway quality is what it's all about because you're going to be able to reduce time taken to construct these things certainly reduce waste I believe by 70 to 90 percent according to the studies that have been carried out in a factory you can cut your suit suit according to your cloth and it's exactly the same with materials you make sure you get the most out of the materials if you're building 
a hundred or a thousand of the same thing. And ultimately, if you can improve the quality and the air tightness and such like under factory conditions, rather than building a prototype every time you build a new building on site, as somebody said earlier, or building something in a muddy field, you're building in factory conditions with good lighting, good health and safety, um, people who are being well looked after and well supervised. Um, so there are a number of advantages as well, in addition to that, in terms of health and safety, uh, accident reduction and all of the other advantages that go with that. Now you cannot get through a talk like this without showing a Model T Ford and I'm sure you've all seen one before but the interesting thing about the Model T Ford is that it is absolutely exemplar in terms of its relationship to where we are now a hundred years later. The Model T Ford first appeared in 1908 um, by uh, and I think it took something like 12 and a half hours to um, construct all the components um, on the assembly line, but Henry Ford had managed through innovation to get that, that down to 93 minutes by 1914, but it was still only black. And you couldn't have colors like this until 1926, when the color technology improved to the extent that all the color paint dried at the same rate as the black paint, and therefore you weren't going to add to the time taken to put these things together. So what he was doing was he was hitting the mass market. It was completely focused. What do people want? This is what they want. And that's what we need to be doing now. We need to be saying, what do people want? This is what we want. This is where we're going to hit the market because that's where we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck. Um, and this is the modern equivalent, the Mini Cooper plant. And of course, somebody raised the question earlier on um, about you know, human beings. Now, robotics and computerization, BIM, and everything else um, that is um, digital is um, going to be a feature of our manufacturing processes. But in the same way as the science fiction writers were talking about all of us uh, spending most of our time enjoying, enjoying an idle existence 100 years ago because of what was going to happen in the future, um, that hasn't happened. And what you find is that these machines Machines and computers are fundamentally stupid. They're only intelligent because we're intelligent. We're intelligent and we're creative and we will continue to be intelligent and creative and we will apply that to the way in which we do things in the future and everybody ultimately will benefit. But if you need to build 100,000 more uh, houses every year and if the house builders are not able to meet that demand either because of market forces which prohibit them from bringing their product to the market faster than the business plan allows them to bring it and they don't want to look foolish with the banks then how are you going to do it it has to be what's happening plus something and this is the plus we're suggesting um, here you are showing uh, my boxes potentially potentially um, being lifted in into position we saw a photo like a photograph like this earlier of bricks being applied and uh, the interesting thing is that if you look at the corner the fact that i i would be hard pressed to tell when i see this thing built that that is not a hundred millimeter 105 millimeter thick brick wall uh, because of this device with with the corners it's quite interesting but you can apply all that stuff to a good standard within the factory and transported to the site. Um, here's Caledonian Modular. I've been working with them on a prototype project for Sir Robert McAlpine. There's uh, what the interior of a box can look like. And once you've snagged that and got it right, you're effectively doing what they do in the automotive industry where they build a prototype they test it to destruction in every conceivable way then they build a million of them. Right? So build the prototype in the factory, snag it to death and say that's the standard, give me 500 of those please. And quality ultimately will improve as a result of that. You may have a combination of the off-site modular and uh, FP McCann system for instance, I know that um, Langerock are doing the same thing at their Explore factory where the, the, you can panelize the exterior as well and you might have a number of different systems operating. Uh, I'm particularly interested in um, CLT. This particular building won the Pukioka Housing, um, won the um, Finnish Wood Award for this Pukioka Housing Block. In, it's very difficult to pronounce when you're speaking fast, in Skyla in Finland in 2015. I love it. They managed to reduce the 
um, timber wastage down to about 30%. This is one of the problems with modular um, CLT, the fact that if you put two thick timber walls together where you might have a, um, a, a 95 by 47 millimeter timber stud wall, then you're using an excessive amount of timber. How do you overcome that? There might be hybrid solutions. Um, here's one that um, I've been working on recently, which is a new hotel in uh, uh, Trafford City in Manchester, where CIMC, who are the largest shipping container manufacturer in the world, are providing the modules. And this is basically uh, how it's being built. In this case, a steel frame with a cast concrete floor with, um, with pads bedded into the concrete to an accuracy of one plus or minus one millimeter to ensure that the boxes, when they go on, don't end up shooting off in different directions. But they're basically, excuse me, it's basically steel shipping te container technology. Um, this is what it looks like. And um, if I, yeah, I, I was intrigued when I saw this because I've made my boxes too short. I can make my boxes this long. Um, and in fact, the, the limits of the technology for this particular company would give you a box that's 3.5 wide by 16.15 meters long. Um, and so I thought, well, I've got to base it on that when I revisit the umbrella house concept. The, here, here it is under construction. And while that's happening, the boxes are being manufactured in China. Sorry about that. We need to be doing them here, but we will. Um, and uh, achieving a, a very high standard and then ultimately the boxes are delivered to site. These are the parameters in terms of lifting possibilities. So there's a flat spot, this spot here, where boxes that long don't fit comfortably on either the 40 foot or the 20 foot lifting rigs. Um, so I thought, well, I'll, and I'll work to those criteria. I met the design, um, the technical director to discuss it. And I came up with this as a corner for Umbrella House using their system where you've got um, um, a concrete core and then you've got nine meter boxes down here nine meter boxes here and 16 meter boxes there and it all seems to fit really quite neatly uh, together within the concept and here we are revisiting umbrella house but you've got to make sure that at the start you're designing for modular square peg in a round hole uh, people have brought me schemes saying like your modular idea can we do this in modular and i say yes if you let me completely redesign it we can do it in modular you have to start off with some fundamental principles and uh, on that Trafford project, this was the, um, this was the traditional construction uh, design and, and build chart showing design at the front and construction phase at the end and how that all condensed. There's a lot of design work up front where you've got to choose the paint colours you know, uh, for those boxes when you, before you've even designed the foundations. But ultimately, you get the benefit when you get on site. In this case, three and a half months, although I think they're actually saving five months, so it's a conservative estimate. And that is money. Five months is money because that's five months of full occupancy revenue downstream that they wouldn't have had otherwise. And that has got to be factored into the equation when you're talking about cost. Um, so everything is predictable above and can't be predicted down below um, to the same extent. So you are going to inevitably have the problem of what's in the ground, uh, what horrible things are lurking there, and you're going to have to deal with that whatever you do. So let's come up with foundation solutions that um, work well with the modular system. Uh, I want to just sh flick through nearly, nearly there. Have I got five minutes? Yes, sir. I got three minutes. You've got, I've got two minutes to show you just a few projects we've been working on. Sefton Street in Liverpool, um, modu modular um, hotel and housing overlooking uh, the Mersey here. And um, this was the Sir Robert McAlpine uh, project. Two towers we conceived it as a little bit different from the courtyard because we're thinking about site, uh, site availability. So two towers with a six-story section in the middle with a private roof garden. And the towers can vary in height according to what the planners require. But these are the boxes I was showing you earlier that we designed. Um, and ultimately, they, they can appear um, in shortened form as penthouses at the top and look a little bit like this. This is one I'm working on currently. Um, Ingalls and Carr are taking this through where we're dropping this building and building a, a new building in its place as a PRS project. Same boxes again. I've tilted these ones at 25 degrees to create curvature in that site and also to create porosity through the site. At present, Renslade House is a big slab of a building that blocks all the view from the historic buildings uh, behind. So these are early stage 
stage, fairly primitive images, but um, we're, we're getting there with them. Brent Cross Residential, huge uh, uh, regeneration project. This is part of it, shopping centre. I've had some involvement with that, but I've also been looking at these two uh, plots, and plot 114 in particular for 580 uh, units, potentially PRS, where we're hiding a lot of parking, 580 parking spaces, wrapping the whole thing with housing, um, and then ultimately we're designing on the basis of the depth that we need for my boxes. So having done this in Revit, um, the green areas uh, have established where the cores are and the ancillary accommodation. Um, the green areas I, I've got, I know exactly what that area is, so I know exactly what I can fit in on the basis of London plan and the ratio mix that we've been given by the client. So I don't need to take it any further than this to tell you exactly what the accommodation is in this building. Um, that's just a reminder of how we're putting those together. Um, section through it and again uh, early stage imagery of the buildings a lot of work to be done on that anyway back to Trafford City and I've got 30 seconds left um, and here we are just uh, this was in November the box is being lifted into position and the surre surreal thing is that when you walk all across there on a building site with all your building site gear on and open the door inside is a perfectly finished uh, hotel room. It's wonderful. There was a James Bond film that had something a little bit like that in it, in a sunken ship. I don't know if you remember, but it was much the same experience. Um, and these were literally just taken bef uh, before Christmas, uh, before I uh, formally left uh, Chapman Taylor. So I imagine that the um, that the cladding and everything is all going on there now, and that has all come together at an incredible rate. It really is amazing to behold. And that's all I have to say to you. Thank you very much.